Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the daily quiz for today. The first question, which of the following statements are correct? The National Board for Wildlife is a statutory organization constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. It is chaired by the Minister for Environment, Forests and Climate Change. It has the powers to give or reserve clearances to projects in and around national parks and other protected areas. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect, so option C would be the right answer. See, the National Board for Wildlife is a statutory organization set up under the Wildlife Protection Act. It basically performs an advisory role and advises the central government in all matters related to the protection of wildlife. Its primary function is to promote the conservation and development of wildlife and forests in the country, and it has complete powers to give or reserve approvals to projects in and around protected areas such as national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. In fact, even the boundaries of these protected areas cannot be altered without the approval of the National Board for Wildlife. This board is chaired by the Prime Minister, not by the Environment Minister. The Prime Minister is the ex officio chairperson of the National Board for Wildlife. In total, this board consists of 47 members and the Minister for Environment, Forest and Climate Change functions as the vice chairperson. This question has been asked because in today's The Hindu newspaper, there is an article on the front page which makes a reference to the Wildlife Board. According to this article, the Supreme Court has questioned the government as to why it has failed to set up an independent environment regulator which it had recommended in its judgment in a 2011 case. In the Lafarge mining case in 2011, the Supreme Court had directed the centre to appoint an independent national regulator for environmental appraisal with regard to large-scale projects that could affect the environment and as well as to enforce the environmental laws and impose penalties on the polluters. The Supreme Court has also questioned as to why the National Board for Wildlife hasn't met in the last six years. Now let's look at the second question. Which of the following statements are correct? The National Social Assistance Programme is a centrally sponsored scheme that provides financial assistance to the elderly, widows and persons with disabilities in the form of social pensions. It represents a significant step towards the fulfilment of the directive principles of state policy under Article 41 of the Constitution. It is administered by the Ministry of Rural Development. All the three statements are correct, so option D is the right answer. See, under the directive principles of state policy, we have Article 41, which directs the state to provide for public assistance, that is social assistance to citizens, in the case of unemployment, old age, sickness, disablement, and other kinds of undeserved want. In such cases, the state has been directed to provide social assistance within the limits of its economic capacity. So by drawing inspiration from Article 41, the Government of India has launched the National Social Assistance Program under which social pensions are provided to the elderly, to widows and persons with disabilities. This question has been asked because we have a related article in today's The Hindu newspaper. According to this article, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Rural Development has criticized the government for providing very meager social pensions to senior citizens, widows and people with disabilities under the National Social Assistance Programme. Under the National Social Assistance Programme, there are five main schemes. The National Old Age Pension Scheme, the National Widow Pension Scheme, the National Disability Pension Scheme, the National Family Benefit Scheme, which provides for financial support to BPL families on account of the death of the primary breadwinner of the family. Then we have the Annapurna scheme, which guarantees food security to old people if they are not covered under the old age pension scheme. Now let's take up the third question. Which of the following statements are correct? Nisar Space Mission proposes to carry a synthetic aperture radar as its payload for capturing very high resolution images. It is a joint mission of ISRO and NASA to monitor terror launch pads in conflict zones. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect, so option A is the right answer. See, NISAR is a joint space mission of ISRO and NASA 
and it carries a synthetic aperture radar as its primary payload. But however, the primary application of the Nisar mission is in the civilian domain, not in the defense domain. And it's being jointly launched by ISRO and NASA to monitor the ice sheets of the world and their possible collapse under the impact of global warming. The synthetic aperture radar on the Nisar mission and its high resolution images will also be useful for disaster management and resource management. And it has no stated defense applications. Because see, synthetic aperture radars, they have both civilian and defense applications. These radars are usually used in Earth observation satellites and they provide for very high resolution images. And they are used for such civilian applications along with defense applications such as border management and as well as cross-border intelligence collection and surveillance. This topic is in news because we have a related article in the Hindu. According to this article, ISRO has completed the development of a part of the synthetic aperture radar of the Nisar mission and it has been dispatched to the United States for further assembly by NASA. See, under the Nisar mission, ISRO and NASA had agreed that the L-band synthetic aperture radar would be developed by ISRO whereas the S-band synthetic aperture radar would be developed by NASA. So accordingly, ISRO has completed its end of the commitment and dispatched the synthetic aperture radar to US where NASA would complete the assembly and send back the completed payload to ISRO so that the Nisar satellite can be launched next year on India's GSLV rocket. Now let's look at the fourth question. Dustlik military exercise is held between which two countries? The correct answer is option C. It is held between India and Uzbekistan. This question has been asked because we have a related article in the Hindu. According to this article, the second edition of the Dustlik military exercise that is Dustlik 2 is all set to be held between India and Uzbekistan in Uttarakhand. This military exercise primarily involves the two armies and it shall focus on counter-insurgency and counter-terrorism. And the Indian Army shall be sharing its expertise in carrying out such operations in mountainous terrain and as well as in rural and urban settings. The exercise will primarily focus on people-centric intelligence-based surgical operations which are designed to minimize the collateral damage especially when these operations are being carried out in urban settings. This exercise will take place as per the mandate of the United Nations and it highlights the strategic and defense relations between India and Uzbekistan. Because Uzbekistan is a key partner for India in the Central Asia region, especially with regard to connectivity to the Central Asian region and as well as with regard to the security and defense of the region. Now let's take up a question from the 2018 prelims paper. 3D printing has applications in which of the following? Preparation of confectionery items, manufacture of bionic ears, automotive industry, reconstructive surgeries, data processing technologies. All the five are correct, so option D is the right answer. See, 3D printing finds application in the manufacturing and preparation of various items in the industry. It is also used in the biomedical industry and it also finds applications in the automotive industry. Even with regard to data processing, 3D printing is used to physically represent the data sets that they are dealing with. Now coming to the fact of the day, we shall have a discussion on the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. See, this legislation was passed in 1967 with the primary objective of preventing any unlawful activities and associations in the country in order to maintain the unity and the integrity of the nation. This law was recommended by the then National Integration Council following India's conflicts with China and Pakistan in 1962 and 65 respectively. Under this act, unlawful activity primarily refers to any such acts by individuals or associations which can threaten or disrupt the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the nation. This legislation provides absolute powers to the central government to define what is unlawful through an official gazette notification and it provides for very stringent punishment including the death penalty and life imprisonment. Under this law, it's not just Indian nationals who can be charged but even foreign nationals can be charged and its jurisdiction extends to crimes committed on foreign soil as well. Under this law, the investigating and law enforcement agencies have been given tremendous powers and the accused can be arrested for 180 days without filing a charge sheet. In 2004, this legislation was amended 
to make this law India's primary legal weapon against terrorism. Through this amendment, Terrorist Act was added to the list of offences and under this, several organisations were banned for terror-related activities. As a result, several terrorist and insurgent outfits such as the Northeast Insurgent Groups, the Naxal Outfits, LTTE, the Khalistan Outfits and the Kashmir-based Outfits. They have all been proscribed as terrorist organisations and they have been banned in the country. Recently in 2019, the Act was again amended which allows the government to designate even individuals as terrorists and it has also given enormous powers to the NIA or the National Investigation Agency which is the designated law enforcement agency for terror related cases and it has been empowered to attach property in related cases and as well as exercise jurisdiction in all terrorism related cases in the country. But however, this law has been highly controversial because of some of its draconian provisions and critics have pointed out that the law has been often misused by the government to target dissent, opposition and criticism. Since the central government has absolute powers to define what is unlawful, the law enforcement agencies could misuse the provision to even target those who are criticizing the government and label it as an anti-national activity that can threaten the integrity and sovereignty of the nation. Then the other problem with the law is that it allows the law enforcement agencies to brand individuals as terrorists even before they are held guilty in a court of law. This goes against the accepted legal doctrine of treating an individual as innocent until proven guilty and the wide sweeping powers provided to the law enforcement agencies is often misused and it is said to violate the human rights and fundamental rights of the citizens. But despite this widespread criticism, the UAPA has become the primary legal weapon of the state to deal with terrorism and terror financing. This topic was taken up for discussion because according to this article in the Hindu, in 2019, the number of cases registered under UAPA has increased by 72%. This data has been tabled in the parliament by the Ministry of Home Affairs in response to a question that was asked and it has informed the parliament that till date around 42 organizations have been listed as terrorist organizations under the first schedule of the UAPA. As you can see in this graph, the number of cases registered over the last few years has gone up considerably. But however, one should note that only 2.2% of these cases registered under UAPA between 2016 and 2019 ended up in a court conviction. So that is it for today. With this, we conclude the discussion and thanks for watching.